I'm Nick Cheshire and I'm here at VEATH 2019 and I'm pleased to say I'm with Dr. Hazim Safi. Welcome. Pleased to be with you. Hazim, I'm very interested in talking to you about training in vascular surgery and your experiences. Perhaps you might tell us something about how your training started. Well, my training is not a straight line. It's convoluted and uh, a lot of what I call it chance I moved to United States in September 1977, actually September 10th, 1977 in Houston. I never left to Houston. I trained with Dr. DeBakey and the training was uh, the Wild West. Uh, luckily for me and lucky for the others, after a year and a half with Dr. Crow DeBakey, he fired nine residents. So I did my vascular and general surgery three and a half years. Filling in for people who were Oh sad. yeah, because he f fired them. And tell me about meeting Stanley Crawford. How did that come about? I met Dr. Stanley Crawford in, uh, in April of 79. I was his fourth year resident with this battlefield promotion. He put me on call every other night in April. So after a month, he called me to his office and told me, why don't you complain? I said, I'm complaining about what? He said, well, I put you on call every other night. I tell him it's better than every night because I survived Dr. DeBakey on call when you stay in the house 60 days without going home. That's, you take care of a handy 20 patient of his and you have to know all the their data and, and, and I have a, and then you have to stay in the intensive care for another 60 days without going home. It's a small cubicle, even it doesn't have a bathroom, you have to go outside. Are you suggesting that this is not how you treat your trainees? The, the... No, no, I, I, actually it, it prevents you from learning. So contrast that with the trainees now, what's training like in your center? And how do well, they work nowadays? Well, we now, the most important thing is uh, to teach them ownership and to think about cases instead of trying to appease me. We want them to take care of the patients. So there is more ownership in their training, but at the same time, nobody can abuse them. But they, the standard doesn't mean down, they have to do their work. If they don't do their work, then we tell them goodbye. These days, obviously, you're most recognized around the world for thoracic abdominal aneurysm repair. Can you tell us something about your first case of thoracal repair and how that differs to the kind of practice you well, have? Well, the there? first case was April 1979. It took us a whole day because at the beginning was mishmash of technique, pastiche, and either midline or thoracal abdominal, even the incision, where they use your midline and go to the left chest, and we discover this area gets some time. It died, had necrosis, and we decided to make it from the embolacus to the costal cartilage after 87. And so what do you think are the key steps, four or five steps in the development of thoracic abdominal surgery to where it is these days? Well, you need a team who's, the team consists of the surgeons, assistant surgeons, and anesthesia dedicated to that and intensive care or our, and, and nurses. And you have to have a good blood bank because when there is a blood bath, it's, you need a lot of blood. And I still remember in a county hospital they were doing thoracic abdominal aortic aneurysm and you know the bleeding in thoracic abdominal went bleed like a liter an hour, so it's not like, and, and somebody asked for fresh frozen plasma. After three hours, they told him, we can send you one. You can't do that. You need the blood bank director with you to help you. But I'm surprised to hear, actually, I, I'm surprised at the focus of your, what you described, because I thought you'd talk about selective visceral cannulation and CSF spinal drainage. I mean, this is the adjunct, but yeah, but I think it's, it's the, the team. team. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Are you still optimistic about the future of vascular surgery? Yeah, I'm always optimistic. I'm planning to live till the age of 90 to beat my dad. He was 88. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm duty bound to ask you about endo and its future. 
Well, the Indo is here to stay. I think the technology yet to match its aim or purpose. I think there is, it's a crude methods to repair the aneurysm. Maybe nanotechnology, new material will come out, will make us obsolete, but at that time I'll be in a jar. Do you think we will still be treating aneurysms in another 50 years time? I think open repair is not going to die. It's, it's going to be maybe 20, 30 percent. But with the caveat, nobody can predict the future. My, anybody who predicts the future, let them buy a lottery ticket. It's, 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 but will, will aneurysms still be a disease in the future? Well, I think the uh, genetic revolution so far did not have any impact on the treatment, in a sense, prevention, where you do target the gene in, in the uterus. But I think the, gen the genetic revolution is telling us which patient you have to operate on early, especially in those with the mutations. Now, I'm just going to take you back to uh, the questions about your training and what it was like. Was there anything about those really arduous times and those long hours that were better than the training is now? You know, I can't be better and it's different, let's put it this way. But I learn a lot from the giant in vascular and cardiac surgery then. So I'm optimistic about the current generation with their new ideas where they mix the genetics, the new technology, and rendering any operation safer than in our generation. Hazim, thank you very much. Fascinating talking to you as always. You're welcome. Thank you.